Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. It is April 16th. Hard to believe. Thursday, April 16th, 2020. I am Laura Brixen. I am the St. Bernard's principal, and this is St. Bernard's Books with Mrs. Brixen. Number 20. Hard to believe. And we are currently reading uh, Holes. We are continuing that. It looks like we have about two days left. And I'm going to try to get through about 60 pages in the next two days. So just a little reminder, please, everyone, to um, please type in and say hi. I'm writing that down right now. Type it in, you know, because uh, so I just so I can have a see, have a little look, see to see if who's coming and or who's here and, and stuff like that. Because sometimes it's hard to tell what these new settings. Um, but anyway, we have a lot to read today. We have a lot to read today, and so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Okay, so we are getting. Whoop! Hold on a second. Oh uh, yeah, Mrs. Brixton's got a technical difficulty. It's just again. <laughs> Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, here we go. Let's start. trying to get this to go. Um, anyways, we're going to get started. And I do, whoa, I already see a bunch of people have tried it. Carol's watching. Carol, I talked to you earlier on the phone. I know the kiddos love seeing that you're here. Jana, oh, yes, here we go. So we have, is Odin on there? Yeah, hopefully everything's going well with a new little baby brother. Yay. Axel's on. And oh, yep, yeah, there we go. We see it's Odin. Very good. Very good, you guys. It's good to see that we already have some people visiting with us today. Let's see if I can try to shift some move thing. No, oh, this isn't even one move. Okay. So we have another joke. Okay. Whoops. Come here. Why are cats bad storytellers? Why are cats bad storytellers? Because they only have one tail. Get it? They only have one Tail, T-A-I-L-T-A-L-E. So there is our joke for the day. Not a good one, but you know, all of these are supposed to be kind of, kind of groaners anyway. <laughs> As you can see, I am in my office, and uh, just had to get a few things done today and do the mail and stuff like that. Um, just a reminder for all of you people out there: if for some reason you end up missing out on any of this, or you come late. Uh, you can go to this, you can go to this link, and it is the link to our um, YouTube channel that has um, all of these videos on them. So without further ado, we are going to get started quickly on this. Oh, now we, oh yeah, yes, and we see Aurora's on. Hi, Aurora. I can see that too. <laughs> Okay, so we are in chapter 37. If you're following along, it's chapter 37, page 167. Page 167. Okay, remember last time we were here, um, Zero had run off. Remember, Zero's like, I am not going to be shoveling any more holes, and he ran off. And Stanley is like, I need to help him. And so he tried stealing a truck no clue on how to drive try stealing a water truck it went right into a hole so he ran off no water um he was aiming towards the thumb remember the mountain it looks like a fist with a thumb 
uh, and uh, trying to aim towards that because he had heard about his own grandfather, coincidence, um, you know, going there for refuge. And so he off just off to the side, he saw like a lump and it was a boat in the dry, you know, just kind of tipped on its side in that dry uh, lake bed and underneath it was zero. And he had found sploosh, remember sploosh? They think it was peaches. Ooh. The name of the boat was Mary Lou. Ooh. Remember that from before? And so that kind of helped them because they didn't have any water. So that kind of helped them to survive. And so meanwhile, they get to the edge of the lake and they have to go up these cliffs, but they're able to climb up. And, and it was just really, really hard on them. Chapter 37. We're almost there, said Stanley. He could see the base of the mountain. Now that they were really almost there, it scared him. Big Thumb was his only hope. If there's no water, no refuge, then they would have nothing, not even hope. There's no exact place where the flatland stopped and the mountain began. The ground got steeper and steeper, and then there was no doubt that they were heading up the mountain. Stanley could no longer see Big Thumb. The slope of the mountain was in the way. It became too steep to go straight up. Instead, they zigzagged back and forth, increasing their altitude by small increments every time they changed direction. Patches of weeds dotted the mountainside. They walked from one patch to another, using the weeds as footholds. As they got higher, the weeds got thicker. Many had thorns, and they had to be careful walking through them. Stanley would have liked to have stopped to stop and rest, but he was afraid that they'd never get started again. As long as Zero could keep going, he could keep going too. Besides, he knew they didn't have much daylight left. As the sky darkened, bugs began appearing above the weed patches. A swarm of gnats hovered around them, attracted by their sweat. Neither Stanley or Zero had the strength to try to swat at them. How are you doing? Stanley said. Zero pointed, thumbs up, and then he said, if a gnat lands on me, it's going to knock me over. Stanley gave him some more words. B-U-G-S, he spelled. Zero concentrated hard and then said, boogs. <laughs> Stanley laughed. A wide smile spread across Zero's sick and weary face as well. Bugs, he said. Good, said Stanley. Remember, it's a short U if there's just no E at the end. Okay, here's a hard one. How about L-U-N-C-H? Lun, lun. Suddenly Zero made a horrible retching noise as he doubled over and grabbed his stomach. His frail body shook violently and he threw up, emptying his stomach of the sploosh. He leaned on his knees and took several deep breaths, and he straightened up and continued going. The swarm of gnats stayed behind, preferring the contents of Zero's stomach to the sweat on the boys' faces. Stanley didn't give him any more words, thinking that he needed to save his strength. But at 10 or 15 minutes later, Zero said, Lunch. As they climbed higher, the patches of weeds grew thicker and they had to be careful not to get their feet tangled in thorny vines. Stanley suddenly realized something. There hadn't been any weeds in the lake. Weeds and bugs, he said. There's gotta be around water around here somewhere. We must be getting close. A wide clown-like smile spread across Zero's face. He flashed the thumbs up sign and then he fell. He didn't get up. Stanley bent over him. Come on, Zero, he said. We're getting close. Come on. Come on. Hector, weeds and bugs. Weeds and boogs. Stanley shook him. They've already ordered your hot fudge sundae, he said, and they're making it right now. Zero said nothing. Oh, you have to excuse me. My nose is running. <laughs> Sorry about that. Chapter 38. Stanley took hold of Zero's forearms and pulled him upright. 
Then he stooped down and let Zero fall on his right shoulder. He stood up, lifting Zero's worn out body off the ground. He lifted the shovel and the sack of jars behind him as he continued up the mountain. Zero's legs dangled in front of him. Stanley couldn't see his feet, which made it difficult to walk through the tangled patches of weeds and vines. He concentrated on one step at a time, carefully raising and setting down each foot. He thought only about each step and not the impossible task that lay before him. Higher and higher he climbed. His strength came from somewhere deep inside him and also seemed to come from the outside as well. After focusing on Big Thumb for so long, it was as if the rock had absorbed his energy and now acted like a giant magnet pulling him up toward it. After a while, he became aware of a foul odor. At first he thought it came from zero, but it seemed to be in the air, hanging heavy all around him. He also noticed that the ground wasn't as steep anymore. As the ground flattened, a huge stone precipice rose up ahead of him, just barely visible in the moonlight. It seemed to grow bigger with each step. And it no longer resembled a thumb. And he knew he would never be able to climb it. Around him, the smell became stronger. It was the bitter smell of despair. Even if he could somehow climb Big Thumb, he knew he wouldn't find water. How could there be water on the top of a giant rock? The weeds and the bugs survived only by occasional rainstorm like the one he had seen from the camp. Still, he continued toward it. If nothing else, he wanted to at least reach the thumb. He never made it. His feet slipped out from under him. Zero's head knocked against the back of his shoulder as he fell and tumbled in a small, muddy gully. As he lay face down in the muddy ditch, he didn't even know if he'd get up ever again. He didn't know if he'd even try. He had come all this way just to. You need water to make mud. He crawled along the gully in the direction that seemed the muddiest. The ground became gloopier. The mud splashed as he slapped the ground. Using both hands, he dug a hole in the soggy soil. It was too dark to see, but he thought he could feel a tiny pool of water at the bottom of his hole. He stuck his head in the hole and he licked the dirt. He dug deeper and as he did so, more water seemed to fill the hole. He couldn't see it, but he could feel it. First with his fingers and then with his tongue. He dug until he had a hole that was about as deep as his arm was long. There was enough water for him to scoop out with his hands and drop onto Zero's face. Zero's eyes remained closed, but his tongue poked out between his lips, searching out the droplets. Stanley dragged Zero closer to the hole. He dug and then scooped some more water and let it pour out of his hands into Zero's mouth. As he continued to widen his hole, his hand came across a smooth, round object. It was too smooth and too round to be a rock. He wiped the dirt off and he realized it was an onion. He bit into it without peeling it. The hot bitter juice burst into his mouth and he could feel it all the way up to his eyes. When he swallowed, he felt its warmth move down his throat and into his stomach. He only ate half. He gave the other half to Zero. Here, eat this. What is it? Zero whispered. A hot fudge sundae. Oh, excuse me guys, my eyes are watering and my nose is running. Chapter 39. Stanley awoke in a meadow, looking up at the giant rock tower. It was layered and streaked with different shades of red, burnt orange, brown, and tan. It must have been over 100 feet tall. Stanley lay a while just looking at it. He didn't have the strength to get up. It felt like the insides of his mouth and his throat were coated with sand. And no wonder. When he rolled over, he saw the water hole. It was about two and a half feet deep and over three feet wide. At the very bottom lay no more than two inches of very brown water. His hands and fingers were sore from digging, especially under his fingernails. 
He scooped some dirty water into his mouth and then swished it around, trying to filter it with his teeth. Zero moaned. Stanley started to say something to him, but no words came out of his mouth. He had to try again. How are you doing? It hurt to talk. Not good, Zero said quietly. With great effort, he rolled over and raised himself to his knees, crawled over to the water hole. He lowered his head into it and lapped up some water. Then he jerked back, clutched his knees to his chest and rolled onto his side. His body shook violently. Stanley thought about going back down the mountain to look for the shovel so he could make the water hole deeper. Maybe that would give them cleaner water. They could use the jars as drinking glasses. But he didn't think he had the strength to go down, let alone make it back up again. He didn't know where to look. He struggled to his feet. He was in a field of greenish white flowers seeming that seemed to extend all the way around the big thumb. He took a deep breath then walked the last 50 yards to the giant precipice and touched it. Tag, you're it. <laughs> then he walked back to zero in the water hole. On the way, he picked one of the flowers. It actually wasn't one big flower, he discovered, but said each flower had a really cluster of little tiny flowers that formed a round ball. He brought it to his mouth. He had to spit it out. He could see part of the trail he had made the night before when he carried Zero up the mountain. If he was going to head back down and look for the shovel, he realized he would have to do that soon while the trail was still fresh. But he didn't want to leave Zero. He was afraid Zero might die while he was gone. Zero was still lying doubled over on his side. I've got to tell you something, he said with a groan. Don't talk, Stanley said. Save your strength. No, listen, Zero insisted. He closed his eyes as his twist twisted with pain. I'm listening, Stanley whispered. I took your shoes, Zero said. Stanley didn't know what he was talking about. His shoes were on his feet. That's all right, he said. You just rest now. It's all my fault, said Zero. It's nobody's fault, said Stanley. I didn't know, Zero said. It's okay, Stanley said. Just rest. Zero closed his eyes, but then again he said, I didn't know about the shoes. What shoes? From the shelter. It took a moment for Stanley to comprehend. Clyde Livingston's shoes? I'm sorry, said Zero. Stanley stared at him. It was impossible. Zero was delirious. Zero's confession seemed to bring him some relief. The muscles in his face relaxed. As he drifted into sleep, Stanley softly sang him the song that had been in his fa family for generations. If only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was just a little bit softer. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon. If only, if only. Chapter 40. When Stanley found the onion the night before, he didn't question how it came to be there. He ate it gratefully. But now as he sat gazing at the big thumb in the meadow full of flowers, he couldn't help but wonder about it. If there was one wild onion, there could be more. He intertwined his fingers and tried to rub out the pain. And then he bent down and he dug up another flower. And this time, pulling up the entire plant, including the root. Back in time. Onions! Fresh, hot, sweet onions! Sam called as Mary Lou pulled the cart down Main Street. Eight cents a dozen! It was a beautiful spring morning. The sky was painted pale blue and pink, the same color as the lake and the peach trees along the shore. Mrs. Gladys Tennyson was wearing just her nightgown and robe as she came running down the street after Sam. Mrs. Tennyson was normally a very proper woman who never went out in public without dressing up in fine clothes and a hat. So it was quite something and surprising to the women of Green Lake to see her running past them. Sam, she shouted. Whoa, Mary Lou, said Sam, stopping the mule in the cart. Good morning, Mrs. Tennyson, he said. How's little Becca doing? 
Gladys Tennyson was all smiles. I think she's going to be all right. The fever broke about an hour ago, thanks to you. I'm sure the good Lord and Doc Hawthorne deserve most of the credit. Oh, the good Lord, yes, and Mrs. Tennyson, but not Dr. Hawthorne. That quack wanted to put leeches on her stomach. Leeches! My word! He said they would suck out the bad blood. Now you tell me, how would a leech know good blood from bad blood? I wouldn't know, said Sam. It was your onion tonic, said Mrs. Tennyson. That's what saved her. The other townspeople made their way to the cart. Good morning, Gladys, said Hattie Parker. Don't you look uh, lovely this morning? Several people snickered. Oh, good morning, Hattie, Mrs. Tennyson replied. Does your husband know that you're parading about in your bed clothes? Hattie asked. <laughs> there were more snickers. My husband knows exactly where I am and how I am dressed. Thank you, said Mrs. Tennyson. We both had been all night and half the morning with Rebecca. She had almost died from stomach sickness. It seems like she ate some bad meat. Hattie's face flushed. Her husband, Jim Parker, was the butcher. It made my husband sick as well, said Mrs. Tennyson, but it nearly killed Becca. That with her being so young, Sam saved her life. Oh, it wasn't me, Sam said. It was the onions. I'm glad Becca's all right, said Hattie contritely. I, I keep telling Jim he needs to wash his knives, said Mrs. Pike, who owned the general store. Hattie Parker excused herself and then quickly turned and walked away. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tell Becca that when she feels up to it to come by the store for a piece of candy, said Mr. Pike. Thank you, I'll do that. Before returning home, Mrs. Tennyson bought a dozen onions from Sam. She gave him a dime and told him to keep the change. Oh, I don't take charity, Sam told her, but if you want to buy a few extra onions for Mary Lou, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. Oh, right then, said Mrs. Tennyson. And just give me my change in onions. Sam gave Mrs. Tennyson an additional three onions, and she fed them one at a time to Mary Lou. She laughed as the old donkey ate them out of her hand. <laughs> Stanley and Zero slept off and on for the next two days. Ate onions, all they wanted, and splashed dirty water into their mouths. In the late afternoon, Big Thumb gave them shade. Stanley tried to make the hole deeper, but he really needed the shovel. His efforts just seemed to stir up the mud and make the water dirtier. Zero was sleeping. He was still very sick and weak, but the sleep in the onion seemed to be doing him some good. Stanley was no longer afraid that he would die soon. Still, he didn't want to go for the shovel while Zero was asleep. He didn't want him to wake up and think that he'd been deserted. He waited for Zero to open his eyes. I think I'll go and look for the shovel, Stanley said. I'll wait here, Zero said feebly, as if he had any other choice. Stanley headed down the mountain. The sleep, the sleep and the onions had done him a lot of good as well. He felt strong. It was fairly easy to follow the trail he had made two days earlier. There were few places he wasn't sure he was going the right way, but just took a little bit of searching until he found the trail again. He went quite a ways down the mountain, but still didn't find the shovel. He looked back up to the top of the mountain. He must have walked right past it, he thought. There's no way he could have carried Zero all the way up from here. Still, he headed down there just in case. He came to a bare spot between two large patches of weeds and sat down to rest. Now, he definitely had gone too far, he decided. He was tired out from walking down the hill. It would have been impossible to have carried Zero up the hill from here, especially after walking all day with no food and water. The shovel must be buried in some weeds. Before starting back up, he took one last look around in all directions. He saw a large indentation in the weeds a little further down the mountain. It didn't seem likely that the shovel would be there, but he'd already come this far. There, lying in some tall weeds, he found the shovel and a sack of jars. He was amazed. He wondered if the shovel and the sack might have rolled down the hill, but none of the jars were broken except for the ones that were broken earlier. And if they had rolled down the hill, it is doubtful that he would have found the sack and the shovel side by side. 
On the way back up the mountain, Stanley had to sit down and rest several times. It was a long, hard climb. Oh, you have to guys excuse me. My nose is running. My eyes are watering. Everything's leaking. <laughs> this one. Okay, quick pause. I just want to see who's here. Oh, yes. So Axel apparently did this challenge. They have this challenge of you do a handstand and your feet rest against the wall. And then you, you have a shirt on and you try to take off the shirt while still doing the handstand. And it looked like Axel did it. All right. And then I see. Oh, <laughs> here we go. It's good to see all of you guys. If you see the gymnast Simone Biles, she did it with her sweatpants. <laughs> it was crazy. Anyway, here we go. Chapter 41. Zero's condition continued to improve. Stanley slowly peeled an onion. He liked eating them one layer at a time. The water hole was now almost as large as the holes he had dug back at Camp Green Lake. It contained almost two feet of murky water. Stanley had dug it all himself. Zero offered to help, but Stanley thought it'd be better for Zero to save his strength. It was a lot harder to dig in water than it was in a dry lake. Stanley was surprised that he himself hadn't gotten sick either from the sploosh, the dirty water, or from living on onions. He used to get quite sick all the time. Both boys were barefoot. They had washed their socks. All their clothes were very dirty, but their socks were definitely the worst. They didn't dip their socks in the hole, afraid to contaminate the water. Instead, they filled the jars and poured the water over their dirty socks. I didn't go to the homeless shelter very often, Zero said, just if the weather was really bad. I have to find someone to pretend to be my mom. If I'd just gone by myself, they, wouldn't have, they would have asked me a bunch of questions. If they find, found out that I didn't have a mom, they would have made me a ward of the state. Oh, what's a ward of the state, Stanley said. Zero smiled. I don't know, but I didn't like the sound of it. Stanley remembered Mr. Podansky telling the warden that Zero was a ward of the state. He wondered if Zero knew that he had become one. I like sleeping outside, said Zero. I used to pretend I was a Cub Scout. I always wanted to be a Cub Scout. I'd see them at the park in their blue uniforms. I never was a Cub Scout, said Stanley. I wasn't good at social stuff like that. Kids made fun of me because I was fat. I like the blue uniforms, said Zero. Maybe I wouldn't have liked being a Cub Scout. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. My mother was once a Girl Scout, said Zero. I thought you didn't have a mother. Everybody has a mother. Yeah, but I, I know that. She said, once, she said she once won a prize for selling the most Girl Scout cookies, said Zero. She was really proud of that. Stanley peeled off another layer of onion. We always took what we needed, Zero said. When I was little, I didn't even know it was stealing. I don't remember when I found out, but we just took what we needed, never more. So when I saw the shoes on display in the shelter, I just reached in the glass case and took them. Clyde Livingston's shoes? asked Stanley. Well, I didn't know they were his. I just thought they were somebody's old shoes. It was better to take someone's old shoes, I thought, than steal a pair of new shoes. I didn't know they're famous. There was a sign, of course, I couldn't read it. And the next thing I knew, everybody's making this big deal about how the shoes are missing. It was kind of funny in a way. And everyone's running around saying, what happened to the shoes? The shoes are gone. And I just walked out the door. No one noticed me. When I got outside, I ran around the corner and immediately took off the shoes. I put them on top of a parked car, and I remembered they smelled really bad. Yeah, those were them, said Stanley. Did they fit you? Pretty much. Stanley remembered being surprised at Clyde Livingston's small shoe, shot, shoe size. Stanley's shoes were bigger. Clyde Livingston had small, quick feet. Stanley's feet were big and slow. I should have just kept them, said Zero. I already made it out of the shelter and everything. I ended up getting arrested the next day when I tried to walk out of a shoe store with a new pair of sneakers. If I just kept those old smelly sneakers, then neither of us would be here right now. Chapter 42. 
Zero became strong enough to help dig the hole. When he finished, it was well over six feet deep. He filled the bottom with rocks to help separate the water from the dirt. He was still the best hole digger around. That's the last hole I'll ever dig, he declared, throwing down the shovel. Stanley smiled. He wished it was true, but he knew they had no choice but to eventually return to Camp Green Lake. They couldn't live on onions forever. They had been completely around the big thumb. It was like a giant sundial. They followed the shade. They were able to see out in all directions. There's no place to go. The mountain was surrounded by desert. Zero stared at Big Thumb. It must have a hole in it, he said, filled with water. You think? Where else would the water be coming from? Zero asked. Water doesn't run uphill. Stanley bit into an onion. It didn't burn his eyes or nose, and in fact, he he no longer even noticed a particularly strong taste. He remembered when he had first carried Zero up the hill, how the air had smelled bitter. It was a smell of thousands of onions growing and rotting and sprouting. Now he didn't smell a thing. How many onions do you think we've eaten? He asked. Zero shrugged. I don't even know how long we've been here. I'd say about a week, said Stanley. And we probably eat about 20 onions a day, so that's a 280 onions, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I bet we really stink. Oh, excuse me, guys. Two nights later, Stanley lay awake, staring up at the star-filled sky. He was too happy to fall asleep. He knew he had no reason to be happy. He had heard or read somewhere that right before a person freezes to death, he suddenly feels nice and warm. He wondered if perhaps he was experiencing something like that. It occurred to him that he couldn't remember the last time he felt happiness. It wasn't just being sent to Camp Green Lake that had made his life miserable. Before that, he'd been unhappy at school, where he had no friends, and bullies like Derek Dunn picked on him. No one liked him, and the truth was, he didn't particularly like himself either. He liked himself now. He wondered if he was delirious. <laughs> He looked over at Zero sleeping near him. Zero's face was lit in the starlight. Oh, excuse me, guys. <laughs> and there's a flower petal in front of his nose that moved back and forth as he breathed. It reminded Stanley of something out of a cartoon. Zero breathed in and the petal was drawn up, almost touching his nose. Zero breathed out and the petal moved toward his chin. It stayed on Zero's face for an amazingly long, long time before it fluttered off to the side. Stanley considered placing it back in front of Zero's nose, but it wouldn't be the same. It seemed like Zero had lived at Camp Green Lake forever, but as Stanley thought about it now, he realized that Zero must have gotten there no more than a month or two before him. Zero was actually arrested a day later, but Stanley's trial kept getting delayed because of baseball. He remembered what Zero had said a few days before. If Zero just kept those shoes, then neither of them would be here right now. As Stanley stared at the glittering night sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car. He was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him on the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck him. Now, he thought so again. It was more than a coincidence. It had to be destiny. Maybe they won't return to Camp Green Lake, he thought. Maybe they could just make it past the camp and then follow the dirt road back to civilization. They could fill the sack with onions and three jars with water. And he had his canteen as well. They could refill the jars and the canteen at the camp. Maybe sneak into the kitchen, get some food. He doubted any counselors were still on guard. Everyone had to think that they were dead. <laughs> Buzzard food. This would mean living the rest of his life as a fugitive. The police would always be after him. At least he could call his parents and still tell them he was still alive. But he couldn't go visit him, them, in case the police were watching the apartment. Although, if everyone thought he was dead, they wouldn't bother to watch the apartment. He would have to somehow get a new identity. 
Now I'm really thinking crazy, he thought. He wondered if crazy person wonders if he's crazy. <laughs> but even as he thought this, an even crazier idea kept popping into his head. He knew it was too crazy to even consider. Still, if he was going to be a fugitive for the rest of his life, it would have to have some money, perhaps a treasure chest full of money. You're crazy, he thought to himself. Besides, just because he found a lipstick container with KB on it, that didn't mean there was treasure buried here. It was crazy. It was all part of his crazy feeling of happiness. Or maybe it was destiny. He reached over and he shook Zero's arm. Hey, Zero, he whispered. Huh? Zero muttered. Zero, wake up. What? Zero raised his head. What is it? You want to dig one more hole? Stanley asked him. Oh, I got to get a drink. Okay. I want to try to read a little more so I don't have quite so much to read tomorrow. Chapter 43. We weren't always homeless, Zero said. I remember a yellow room. How old were you when you... Stanley started to ask, but couldn't find the right words. Um, moved out. I don't know, must have been real little because I don't remember too much. I don't remember moving out. I remember standing in a crib with my mother singing to me. She held my wrists and made my hands clap together. She used to sing that song to me, the one that you sang. It was different, though. Zero spoke slowly, as if searching his brain for memories and clues. And then later, I know we lived on the street. But I don't know why we left the house. I'm pretty sure it was a house and not an apartment. And I know my room was yellow. It was late afternoon and they were resting in the shadow of the thumb. They spent the morning picking onions and putting them in the sack. It didn't take long, but long enough so they had to wait another day before heading down the mountain. They wanted to leave at the first hint of daylight so they had plenty of time to make it to Camp Green Lake before dark. Stanley wanted to make sure he could find the right hole. Then they would hide by it until everyone went asleep. They would dig for as long as it seemed safe and not a second longer. And then, treasure or no treasure, they'd head up the dirt road. If it was absolutely safe, they'd try to steal some food and water from the camp kitchen. I'm good at sneaking in and out of places, Zero said. Remember, Stanley had warned, the door to the rec room squeaks. Now, as he lay on his back, trying to save his strength for the long days ahead, he wondered what happened to Zero's parents, but he didn't ask. Zero didn't like answering questions, and it was better to just let him talk when he felt like it. Stanley thought about his own parents. In her last letter, her mom was worried that they might be evicted from their apartment because of the smell of burning sneakers. They could easily become homeless as well. <laughs> Again, he wondered if they'd been told that if he ran away from camp, were they told that he was dead? An image appeared in his head of his parents hugging each other and crying, and he tried not to think about it. Instead, he tried to recapture the feelings he had the night before, the inexplicable feelings of happiness, the sense of destiny. But those feelings didn't return. He just felt scared the next morning they headed down the mountain they dunked their caps in the water hole before putting them on their heads zero held the shovel and stanley carried the sack which was crammed with onions and the three jars of water they left the pieces of the broken jar on the mountain this is where i found the shovel stanley said pointing out a patch of weeds zero turned and looked up toward the top of the mountain that's a long way you were light stanley said and you'd already thrown up everything that was inside of you he shifted the sack from one shoulder to the other. It was heavy. He stepped on a loose rock, slipped, and then fell hard. The next thing he knew, he was sliding down the steep side of the mountain. He dropped the sack and the onions spilled around him. He slid into a patch of weeds and grabbed onto a thorny vine. The vine ripped out of the earth, but it did slow him enough that he was able to stop himself. Are you all right? Zero asked from above. Stanley groaned as he pulled the thorn out of the palm of his hand. Yeah, he said he was all right. He was more worried about the jars of water. Zero climbed down after him, retrieving the sack along the way. Stanley pulled some of the thorns out of his pant legs. 
the jars had not been broken. The onions had protected them like styrofoam packing material. Glad you didn't do that when you were carrying me, Zero said. They lost about a third of the onions, but recovered many of them as they continued down the mountain. When they reached the bottom, the sun was just rising above the lake. They walked directly toward it. Soon, they stood at the edge of the cliff, looking down on the dry lake bed. Stanley wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the remains of the Mary Lou off in the distance. You thirsty? Stanley asked. No, said Zero. How about you? No, Stanley lied. Oh, <laughs> I like what Mrs. Zero said. Speaking of onions, it's making your eyes water. <laughs> yes, I think so. Thanks, Mrs. Zero. <laughs> no, Stanley lied. He didn't want to be the first one to take a drink. Although they didn't mention it, it had become kind of a challenge between him and Zero. They climbed down into the frying pan. It was a different spot from where they had climbed up. They eased themselves down from one ledge to another and let themselves slide in other places, being especially careful with the sack. Stanley could no longer see the Mary Lou, but headed in what he thought was the right direction. As the sun rose, so did the familiar haze of heat and dirt. You thirsty? Zero said. No, said Stanley. Because you have three jars of water, said Zero. I thought maybe it was getting too heavy for you. If you drink some, it will lighten your load. I'm not thirsty, said Stanley, but if you want a drink, I'll give you some. I'm not thirsty, said Zero. I'm just worried about you. Stanley smiled. I'm a camel, he said. They walked for what seemed like a very long time, and they still never came across the Mary Lou. Stanley was pretty sure that they were heading in the right direction. He remembered that when they left the boat, they were headed toward the setting sun. Now they're headed the, toward the rising sun. He knew the sun didn't rise and set exactly in the east and west, more southeast and southwest, but he wasn't sure that really made a difference. His tho throat felt it was coated with sandpaper. You sure you're not thirsty? <laughs> he asked. Not me, said Zero. His voice was dry and raspy. When they finally did take a drink, they agreed to do it at the same time. Zero, who was now carrying the sack, set it down and took out two jars, giving one to Stanley. They decided to save the canteen for last, since it couldn't accidentally break. You know, I'm not thirsty, Stanley said as he unscrewed the lid. I'm just drinking so you will. <laughs> I'm just drinking so you will, said Zero. They clinked jars together, and each, watching the other, poured the water into their stubborn mouths. Zero was the first to spot the Mary Lou, maybe a quarter mile away and just a little off to the right. They headed for it. It wasn't even noon when they reached the boat. They sat against the shady side and rested. I don't know what happened to my mother, Zero said. She left and never came back. Stanley peeled an onion. She couldn't always take me with her, Zero said. Sometimes she had to do things by herself. Stanley had the feeling that Zero was explaining things to himself. She'd tell me to wait for a certain place for her. And when I was real little, I had to wait in small places like, like a porch step or a doorway. Now don't leave here till I get back, she'd say. I never liked it when she left. I had a stuffed animal, a, a little giraffe. I'd hug it the whole time she was gone. When I got bigger, I was allowed to stay in bigger areas like stay in this block or don't leave the park. But even then, I still held Jeffy. Stanley guessed that Jaffe was the name of Zero's giraffe. And then one day, she didn't come back, Zero said. His voice sound, sounded suddenly hollow. I waited for her at Laney Park. Laney Park, said Stanley. I, I've been there. You know the playscape, said Zero. Yeah, I played on it. I waited there for more than a month, Zero said. You know the tunnel that you crawl through between the slide and the swinging bridge? That's where I slept. They ate four onions apiece and drank about a half a jar of water. Stanley stood up and looked around. Everything looked the same in all directions. When I left camp, I was heading straight towards the big thumb, he said. And I saw the boat off to the right. So that means we have to turn a little to the left. Zero was lost in thought. Uh, what? Okay, he said. They headed out. It was Stanley's turn to carry the sack. 
Some kids had a birthday party, Zero said, and I guess it was about two weeks after my mother left. There was a picnic table next to the playscape and the balloons were tied to it. The kids looked to be about the same age as me. One girl said hi to me and asked me if I wanted to play. I wanted to, but I didn't. I knew I didn't belong at the party, even though it wasn't their playscape. There was this one mother who kept staring at me like I was some kind of monster. Then later a boy asked me if I wanted a piece of cake. And then that same mother told me, go away. And she told all the kids to stay away from me. So I never got a chance to have a piece of cake. I ran away so fast. I, I forgot Jaffe. Did you ever find him? Uh, it? For a moment, Zero didn't answer. Then he said, he wasn't real. Stanley thought about how his own parents, how awful it would be for them to never know if he was dead or alive. He realized that was how Zero must have felt, not knowing what happened to his own mother. He wondered why Zero never mentioned his father. Hold on, said Zero abruptly. We're going the wrong way. Well, this is right, said Stanley. You were heading toward Big Thumb when you saw the boat to your right, said Zero. That means we should have turned right when we left the boat. You sure? Zero drew a diagram on the dirt. Here's the diagram. Whoop. See, there's a big thumb. Whoop. There's a big thumb. There's the boat. And there's Camp Green Lake. Stanley still wasn't sure. We need to go this way, Zero said, first drawing a line on the map and then heading that way. Stanley followed. It didn't feel right to him, but Zero seemed so sure. Sometime in the middle of the afternoon, a cloud drifted across the sky and blocked out the sun. It was a welcome relief. Once again, Stanley felt that destiny was on his side. Zero stopped and held out his arm to stop Stanley too. Listen, Zero whispered. Stanley didn't hear anything. They continued walking very quietly and Stanley began to make out the faint sounds of Camp Green Lake. Oh, hold on a second, come here. We have a special guest star. Popping in to say hi. Hello. It's Father Rick. Miss you all. Yes. yes. So we have oh, Veda and Jackson are watching. Hope you had a great Easter. Yay. I know he just came to drop off some mail and we got Mrs. Zares watching. Mm -hmm. Axel. Oh, Ophelia and Oliver are watching. Hey. Mrs. Brickell. So we got lots of people. Carol was watching <laughs> for part of it at least. Okay. So yeah, Father dropped off the mail and I'm just finishing up reading this little chapter. I'm Yes. See you. See Miss you. you. Yes. <laughs> hey, we'll talk to you later. Okay. I'm here for a while. <laughs> My father. It's always nice to have guest stars coming in. So remember, they continued walking very quietly, and Stanley began to make out the faint sounds of Camp Green Lake. They're still too far away to see the camp, but he could hear a blend of indistinct voices. As they got closer, he occasionally could hear Mr. Sir's distinctive bark. As they walked slowly and quietly, aware that sounds travel in both directions, they approached a cluster of holes. Let's wait here until they go in, said Zero. Stanley nodded. He checked to make sure there was nothing living in it and then climbed down into a hole. Zero climbed into the one next to him. Despite having gone the wrong way for a while, it hadn't taken them nearly as long as Stanley had expected. Now, they just had to wait. The sun cut through the cloud and Stanley felt its rays beating down on him. But soon, more clouds filled the sky, shading Stanley and his hole. He waited until he was certain the last campers had finished for the day. Then he waited a little longer. As quietly as possible, he and Zero climbed up out of their holes and crept towards camp. Stanley held the sack in front of him, cradled in his arms instead of over his shoulder to keep the jars from clanking each other. A wave of terror rushed over him when he saw the compound, the tents, the rec room, the warren's cabin under the two oak trees. The fear made him dizzy. He took a breath, summoned his courage, and went on. That's the one, he whispered, pointing out the hole where he had found the gold tube. It was still about 50 yards away, but Stanley was pretty sure it was the right hole. There was no need to risk going any closer. They climbed down into adjacent holes and waited for the camp to fall asleep. I'm going to stop there. Oh, can you believe it?
<laughs> when we come back tomorrow, we're going to finish the book. Yep, we're going to finish the book. We read a lot today. It was so good to see all of you guys. And then I will tell, oh, yeah, I see here the highs from Axel and Aurora. Yes, and Veda and Jackson. Yes. Oh, and Trudy Erickson. Oh, hello, Nora. Yes. And then, so, but I will let Father Rick said, I will let Father Rick know that you said hi. And with that, we're just going to do our closing song, okay? Because we read a lot today. You can join in. All right, have a wonderful day, you guys. Get outside. It is going to be nice out.